Good morning again, Green Spring. The other day I was looking through, it was a, actually a couple of months ago, I was looking in the library at Town Center at the books that residents have written. You know, we have a corner in the library where we have the authors from Green Spring have written books. And I saw this one that was called Born Rich in a Time That Is Gone Forever. And I thought that was an interesting title and I picked it up and thumbed through it and looked at some of the pictures and the titles of the of it. Actually, I read a little bit of it, but it, it was very interesting. And I said, gee, that might be a good uh, candidate for uh, who's who. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I found out later that some, some uh, people suggested that John Lee uh, be on our who's who program. And uh, John Lee was the author. John Lee Jr. was the author of that book. So I talked to John and he agreed to come on with me this morning. Uh, I hope you, uh, I'm, and his book, Born Rich, uh, I'm sure we'll show it at some time, but uh, I don't think he really means he had a lot of money as he was growing up. That wasn't the, the idea of being rich, and I'm sure that's true of many of us. It's not our idea of being rich when we were growing up, but we were rich in many ways. Well, anyway, I looked up the book on Amazon and found it, the reviews there, and the reviews were very, very favorable. So uh, John has had also a great career, uh, not only uh, in, with 32 years in the U.S. Department of Agricultural Economic Research and 10 years as a professor of agricultural economics at Mississippi State University. John and Marie Lee moved here from Tuscaloosa, Alabama and in May 2015. And so they've been here almost a year and they're very active in the community activities. And uh, before we get started into the book, John, why, why, how about telling us about your family, your children, your grandchildren, and so forth? We might never get to it if we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm happy to do that. Marie and I were both uh, married before, so I had three children. She had one daughter when we got married. But the family came together. We have a wonderful close family now. Those three children and one daughter, we now have seven grandchildren. They're scattered from Maryland to Florida, up and down the East Coast. Makes it very hard for us to get together occasionally, but uh, it's a wonderful family. And You don't uh, have anyone li living near here then, other than Maryland? I have a grandson in Maryland. I have a grandson in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, okay. After that, they're all scattered further south. Okay, well, in a few minutes, uh, would you tell us about your early life? Now, I said a few minutes because <laughs> the book, it takes you a few hours to read. And that's his early life. That's right. How about your early life with your parents and where you grew up and so forth? They say the f most important thing you can do in your life is choose the right parents. Mm -hmm. Well, you have nothing to do with that <laughs> yourself, actually. But I was very fortunate. I had wonderful, wonderful parents. My mother was a young girl whose father grew up in the adjoining county on a small farm. She came to this little community where I grew up as an 18-year-old agent for the railroad depot. Ah. Took care of passenger and freight, uh, freight and also the uh, telegraph operation. My dad had grown up right there in that little community. He was, uh, parents were a little small farmers. They came from, they both came from salt of the earth type families. They were really good people. And they gave me the kind of surrounding of not only love, but also uh, I guess the kind of value foundation that was really great for life that I wish everybody could have that for good fortune to have. It was a wonderful growing up in this small community. Everyone knew each other because it was very small. Now the name of the community was? Dancy, Alabama. D-A-N-C-Y. Yeah. Dancy, Alabama. It's a funny name, but it's named after a doctor who had first laid out the town. Yeah. And it's in central Alabama on the extreme western edge. That's correct. Yeah. Right on, the, right on the edge. It's in a part of the country where the soil is what's called the Black Prairie soil, hmm. um, good rich soil. The saying there is, you stick to it in the summertime, and it'll stick to you in the wintertime. <laughs> that was about right. But I grew up with a lot of freedom. My brother eventually had three brothers, but the brother next to me, I was the oldest, uh, he and I were very close. We could go hunting in the woods. We could go walk anywhere in town. Uh, do anything we wanted to do, and all we had to do was be home by dinner time, or lunch time, or whatever. 
But uh, we grew up with all kinds of people. It was a very diverse community, and it was just a wonderful place, a wonderful surrounding to grow up. Gave you a sense of freedom that you look back to and say, what a wonderful way to grow up. So you didn't have any sisters. You, you had three four brothers. brothers. I mean, three brothers, three four brothers. of us boys. Yeah. My, uh, my dad had a friend who was always bragging about his four girls, and they always said, can't beat me. I've got four queens. My dad said, I can top that. I got four kings. <laughs> All right. Well, all right, you had a lot of stories about growing up in Dancy in your book. And uh, why don't we get a picture of the book here? So if you haven't done it already, I, I haven't seen it. But it's Born Rich and in a time that's gone forever. Here's a picture of them with a yoke of oxen. No, not oxen. Those are two uh, beef calves. Those oh, are oh, two four-inch club beef calves. Oh, okay, yes. okay. Uh, fattened for the... Uh, the county show, and then eventually to the state fair. And there's no yoke on them either, is there? Oh, no yoke. No. <laughs> no, there's, a, there's a halter. Well, I grew up with the yokes of oxen, so I looked at it immediately and thought of it as a yoke of oxen, John. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think I ever saw an oxen as a youngster. Is that right? Right. All right. Okay, well, let's t tell us a couple of stories that you enjoy in your... Well, there are... There are I obviously enjoyed them all. There are quite a few, but one I'll tell you about was... Well, um, first of all, why did you write it? Why did you write the book? When I retired for the second time, we'd moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, I was uh, thinking about what I wanted to do, and I got reflecting back on how I grew up, and I said, well, I'll jot down some things for my kids, oh. some stories, and I started handwriting at first and then pecking away at the typewriter. I'm not a fast typer. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I accumulated uh, quite a stack of paper, <laughs> and my wife came in and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm putting together some stories about growing up. And she looked at it and she said, you have enough for a book there. And she really started the process of helping me put it together, make it uh, read in the flow from your oldest, youngest age to the oldest age, and edited it and put it together. She's a desktop publisher, a wonderful one, and she does a great job with things like that. And before long, she had it looking like a real book. Good. So we decided to take it seriously and do some editing, and she did, which she did greatly and came up with a book. Uh, didn't, in, didn't start with the intention of writing a book, but we ended up with So one. it was really for your kids. For my kids. Yeah, yeah. And other people have enjoyed it, particularly the people who grew up in rural areas. Yeah. And uh, back in the 30s, 40s, grew up on a farm in a rural area, seemed to identify with it, yes. Well, I certainly did. I, I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed your stories. They were, you know, they were real life stories. Well, tell us, do you have any favorite stories that you in there? Oh, they're I'm all sure my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that happened that made a mark on me in my younger years was when I was maybe uh, nine, eight, nine, ten, somewhere along in there, 1942 or three, there was a big prisoner war camp was built oh. in our hometown. That's a story in itself. Well, that was but Aliceville, right? Aliceville, a little yeah. town where I rode the school bus 13 miles to Aliceville to go to school, yeah. elementary school then high school. But this camp came up and was soon occupied by 6,000 German prisoners. They were mostly not hardcore Nazis. They were people who had been drafted and really yeah. were happier being there than fighting in the war. And they allowed farmers and other people, local business people, to hire these prisoners out, to give them a chance to get out of the prison and see how Americans lived. So my dad decided to hire some for the farm. Oh. We tried them with, uh, in the hay field with picking cotton, all kinds of things. And in some cases it worked out and some didn't. So there's some funny stories and some disastrous stories. But one of the things that happened, I called the Great Escape. We foiled it. My brother Jimmy and I were used to getting up on Sunday morning before the mail truck came and before we went off to church and just going exploring around in the woods. We were near a pond one day north of our home and on the highway that came from Aliceville down to the town of Dancy. We saw these, uh, we were pretending we were spies, you know, we had kids do. <laughs> we were peering out of the bushes, watching who might be coming down the road. Here came two men walking down the road, and as they got closer, we could see PW, prisoner of war, on their clothes. We got all excited. We said, well, uh, we got to go tell the folks about this. So I'll cut it short, but we just 
uh, ran around through the woods so we wouldn't be detected back around to the store where my dad and a bunch of people were waiting for the Sunday morning mail to come in and said, Daddy, Daddy, there's German prisoners coming down the road. Boys, you've been, you've been listening to too much radio or reading <laughs> stories, comic books. No, watch them. Sure, they're, they're coming. Sure enough, they all stood out there, and down the road came the prisoners right by the store. The men all stood there and gawked. They walked right by and kept going. Nobody could say anything. Finally, one of them said, we got to stop them. And my brother <laughs> Jimmy was jumping up and down. Stop them, catch them, catch them. <laughs> so some of the men ran home right quick, got their rifles and shotguns and things, and all jumped in the car. They couldn't fit in the car, but they got into two cars. Looked like all the guns sticking out the one that looked like two old <laughs> battleships with the guns sticking out. Caught them about a mile down the road and stopped them and brought them back to the store, rang the prisoner of war camp, and finally they admitted that they were missing two prisoners and they came and got them. But in the meantime, everyone had put their guns down. They were sitting on the gravel in front of the store uh, in a circle. The Germans were telling, prisoners, uh, telling stories about life and about being in the war. And the other men, the guns all put away, were sitting there laughing and talking about the stories, offering them cigars or cigarettes or whatever. It turned into a, just a warm <laughs> gathering. They hated to go back to the prison. Well, they really, the, the purpose of them escaping was to try to find a job, right? That's correct. There was a little town south of where we live called York, Alabama, yeah. Y-O-R-K. They thought that was New York. And they said, we're going to find a job <laughs> for after the war. Yeah. That's where they were going. They weren't trying to be malicious or anything. I thought, you, I thought your favorite story would be about in the cotton patch when they put some gravel in the bottom of the cotton <laughs> That was sacks. a good story. They, uh, <laughs> we hired them to pick cotton. It didn't work out too well because they learned that uh, they were being paid by the pound. So as they picked cotton down the rows, they would drop stones into the bags of cotton and it made the bags way more. When we found out about it, we had to switch the way we paid them to paying them by the day. Well, that meant they figured out they didn't have to work very hard and got the same pay. So neither way worked out. <laughs> All right. There are lots of stories about the prisoners and other things. Well, you, your dad had a big farm in, in Dancy, around Dancy, and you did a lot of work on that farm as a young man and growing up. And as I read from the book, you were probably the mainstay is, uh, on the farm is early in the, well, prior to going to college. And then you uh, went to college and uh, uh, did you ever think about coming back and being a farmer because yes. you, uh, okay. Yes, I did. In fact, that was my intention when I went to college was to go learn to be a good farmer and come back and be a successful yeah. one. It was unrealistic because our farm really wasn't big enough to, uh, to divide and I didn't have money to buy land. Yeah. But I went to college, interrupted by two years in the Army. I came back, finished. My brother Jimmy caught up with me and we graduated together. And in the process, <clears throat> I met a young professor who c convinced me to take some economics courses. Oh. He became not only my good professor, but he became my best friend. Mm. <clears throat> and so all along I intended to go back. So after I graduated with a BS degree, I went back home. Uh, didn't have any land, so I was working for my dad. One summer, July 4th, actually July the 4th, hot day, 99 degrees, humidity was high. <laughs> we were out in the hayfield bailing some rained on alfalfa hay that was all brown dust. And there's so much dust that was when the the hay baler would throw these clouds of dust up and it would come down on me. I just turned as black as my clothes were. Yeah. And my mother came to the hay field and, and brought us tea and lunch, as she usually did, and said, you have a letter from Auburn offering you a chance to uh, go back and get a master's degree. Oh. And I said, oh, wonderful. I realized, of course, then my mother read my mail. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I said, there's got to be a better way to make a living than this. Yeah. So I'll go back, and maybe I'll come back to the farm, but I'll learn, I'll be a better business manager. Before we go to the master's degree, you said you were two years in the Army. Yes. Uh, and that was during the Korean? Uh, End of the Korean War, I got drafted oh. in, the, in the Army. I uh, was in the Signal Corps uh, oh, okay. several months at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, training there. rest of my time was really at uh, Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, I Fort told Hood. people the only foreign country I could get to was Texas. <laughs> And they don't necessarily consider themselves a foreign country. I guess all the other states are. Huh? Right. Yeah. All right. Well, you, you're now going to, and you went to Auburn. Went to which Auburn. Which then was known as? 
Alabama Polytechnic Institute, API. Oh, okay, which we had VPI, Virginia Polytechnic. Same thing. So it's a technical school more. Right. Okay. Well, it's a full-scale university now, and yeah. it was then, but they hadn't shared the old name. Yeah. Now called Auburn University. Yeah. Yes. I got a master's degree uh, in economics, and I don't know when the turning point came, but somewhere in, along in the process, I just assumed, my professor assumed, that I'd go on and get a PhD in economics, maybe go to a college and teach after that. We uh, talked about where to go, and my professor said, now, you're my first graduate student. He was a young guy. Uh -oh. You're my first graduate student. Uh, you need to go to a really good school. And he would tell me about this <laughs> university and that university. And the way he judged the faculty was how many Harvard graduates they had on the faculty. Uh -huh. And I jokingly said one day, if that's your criteria, why don't I go to Harvard? We both had a good laugh out of that. And no, we didn't, never had anyone out of that department go to Harvard. The next day, he came in all excited, and he said, I couldn't sleep last night. Why don't we do that? <laughs> and so he said, get your application in. Yeah. Turns out it was only two weeks away from the deadline to get an application uh -huh. in. <clears throat> I sent in the application. They sent me a note back saying, here's the form you got to fill out. And I had to write a 500-word essay on why I wanted to go to Harvard. I think I put my most creative effort into the, writing that essay. Yeah, but right. I got admitted. I went through. A, it was a great experience. Um, it was a life-changing experience because it was a culture and environment I'd never been in before, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. Now, were, you, you, the the BS was involved in agriculture. Yes. Uh, your master's was involved in economics in the Harvard. Was it was it anything related to agricultural economics? The master's was agricultural economics, oh, okay. and at Harvard I got a degree in general economics. Okay. Never thinking I'd go back to work in agriculture. Yeah. But I ended up in, in working in the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, how did that happen? <clears throat> I went to, as a graduate student at Harvard, I went to a uh, meeting of the American Economic Association in New York City to hear uh, Henry Wallace, the former vice president, ah. give a speech. He was in his 90s, and it was one of his last public appearances. And I wanted to hear him, so I bummed a ride with one of the professors, went there, and talked my way into the meeting without paying my admission fee. <laughs> and uh, heard him there, and I sat between two men I didn't know. When I got back to school, my major professor up there uh, was John Galbraith. He oh. said, uh, I had contacts with uh, uh, two people from USDA who wanted to talk to you about employment there. Well, first I wasn't interested, and he said, well, they pay pretty well. Well, I had two children by that time, and the third one on the way. Yeah. And I said, well, I gotta have, some, I gotta have a job. <laughs> So I ended up, uh, they made me a very nice offer. I ended up going to Washington to work in USDA, dropped, moving down my few belongings in a U-Haul trailer and uh, yeah. started to work in July 1, 1962. 60, now you were working in Economic Research Service. What, what in the world is the Economic Research? That's an agency, research? yes. <clears throat> economic Research Service is an agency that um, does analysis of the economic impacts of various kinds of policies and various, various kinds of changes going on in agriculture and in the food system. They've been doing that for years, and they're a very respected agency, very objective. There's no politics involved in what they do. Um, there are politics of, politicians above them, but this agency always protected its uh, freedom to do objective, honest research. So we looked at uh, things like uh, impacts of various trade policies, impacts of, uh, and we try to do complete impacts, yeah. not just uh, the answer that politicians might want, but all the other ripple effects of taking some particular step or some particular action, some technology, whatever it might be. And we covered food, we covered trade, we covered agricultural production, we covered environmental uh, policies, uh, anything related to the natural resource base, the agriculture, the food system. What about the actual research into the crops uh, and and uh, improving crops and things like that. Was that part of the? No, uh, the, the physical that, research, that is the research on technology yeah. in agriculture, was done by another agency. Oh. We looked at the economic impacts and the social impacts of these various changes. Well, were, some of the, were there some major issues that came up during? Now, you were there 32 years, and as yes. I recall, the last 10 years you were head of that department, right? Yes, the last 13 years I was head of the agency. Last 13. And that was a great experience. I learned that one of my 
responsibilities in addition to making sure we were working on the highest priority kinds of issues was to uh, keep the politicians off our back because they had questions they wanted answered and they knew what they, they knew what they wanted as answers. <laughs> but we had to say, we don't do it unless the chips fall where they may and you can use it or not use it, but we're going to find a way to publish this results of this so the public is informed. So, uh, yeah, we, we worked on some big issues like um, Carter had a trade embargo. Uh, he embargoed grain to the Soviets when they invaded Afghanistan. Mm. We forget about that these days. <laughs> but uh, the, some people in Congress were very upset about that, didn't like the embargo. When that uh, next administration came in after Carter, they wanted to uh, refute that embargo, and so they said, we need to do a detailed study to show all the bad effects of that embargo. I knew that would be highly sensitive, so I commissioned a group in the universities to work with us, a very distinguished group of professors, and they came back with a conclusion, a big, thick study. Yeah. But the main conclusion was there was not that much negative impact on the U.S. pharma of that embargo because what we didn't sell to the Russians, we sold to someone else, and someone else sold to the Russians. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> but they didn't like that at all, and the Secretary of Agriculture uh, refuted this study, yeah. and then saw it, and that very night he did that on TV, I came, I was going to some dinner, and he was seated right next to me. And he turned to me and he said, you understand, of course, why I had to do that. And I said, yes, sir, I understand. <laughs> well. Did you work with any other countries, or was this only internal? Uh, we were not an international agency as such, but our, we looked at, uh, looked at developments worldwide that would impact American agriculture and American food. And so I worked in uh, countries in every continent of the world, either reviewing projects we were doing jointly with the USAID, or projects that we were doing at request of some other agency, or request of the country that we got approval to help. Hmm help them d develop their own capacity to do analysis and do research. Um, there were some great stories out of that. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> well, we don't have too, too much time for a lot of great stories, so <laughs> unfortunate. Uh, but when you uh, began to work, or when you left Harvard, you really were thinking about teaching yes. at some school. And uh, instead of seeking a, uh, a place to teach, you went to the Department of Agriculture. Did you have it, continue to have in mind that one of these days you might be able to go back and teach? Uh... I did. Oh. I did. And so when I retired from USDA, I had an offer from Mississippi State University to come there. I told them what I wanted to do was to teach and write and interact with students. I was tired of being an administrator. Yeah. So they said, well, you can do that later. Right now we need a department head. Wow. And so I became head of the Department of Agricultural Economics, and I was there for nearly a decade. And that was a great experience. Um, we had considered, my wife and I, Marie, and I had considered going to either Poland or New Zealand. But she said, go to Mississippi. It's only, <laughs> the school's only 50 miles away from where your parents are still wow. alive and live on the home farm. My brother was there, my two brothers were still there. The young brothers. Uh, two youngest Jimmy. brothers. Oh. Uh, no, Jimmy had passed away. Okay. He died at age 49, yeah. to my great sorrow. But we went back there, and that was a wonderful experience. I really enjoyed being there, although I didn't get to do as much teaching as I wanted. I taught a few courses yeah. and um, learned a lot about Mississippi. I'm sure you did. Yes, it's, it's quite a place. It's different from anywhere else in the world. <laughs> but it was, it was nice, I'm sure, to be close to the home place. It was indeed very good. I spent... I got to live with my parents, not live with them, but get to know them again yeah. closely the last 10 years or so of their lives. My mother lived to be 101, just oh, died two right? years ago, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, she was. Uh, well, I was surprised that uh, when you left uh, Mississippi State that you moved over to Tuscaloosa. Why didn't you stay in Starkville? That was our intent. We built a home we thought was our final place. In Starkville? In Starkville, yeah. yes. Um, but our daughter, Marie's daughter, had followed us there, and. She and her husband had two kids that we practically raised, and yeah. my wife was very close to them. And so they Over in Tuscaloosa. And, no, they were in Starkville, oh, right okay, in Starkville. Okay, okay. But the husband got a better job in Tuscaloosa, and they moved. Uh, okay. And we missed the kids so much, I decided to go ahead and retire, and we moved over to 
Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which was still only about uh, 60 miles away from the home farm yeah, where I On the up. other side of it. So, and I had family in Tuscaloosa, so it became real close home for us. Good. Yeah. We enjoyed it very much. All right. Well, you moved from Alabama to Greenspring. And you, uh, your closest kin is over in Maryland. How would you pick Greenspring? Marie said, we're going to find us a place that we can settle down and the kids won't have to worry about taking care of us when we get old. I said, well, you're still young. I'm old, but I'm not old enough to move to a retirement <laughs> home. She kept pushing on that. We had a letter from a person who lived here in Greenspring, a former colleague. Oh. And by the way, I have five or six former colleagues living right here in Greenspring, and that's really? a great source of um, pleasure and satisfaction to me. I'm sure it is. One of them sent us a Christmas letter and talked about their new address in this place called Greenspring. He told us about it. We said, contact them and find out more. Well, eventually they talked us into coming up and taking a look at the place. So we drove up from Alabama, took a look at it, got on the waiting list, went back home, and Sheila called us a little later and said, Sheila Willingham, and said, uh, we have a place for you. We came, we looked at it, we didn't like the rooms we saw, and on the way out, we passed an empty apartment. We said, what about this one? She said, oh, I forgot about that one. We looked at it, and we said, this is it. Yeah. And we moved here in May of last year. We are very happy here. We love our apartment, Good. and we like, the, we like Green Spring very much. And you, you've built some uh, associations here, I, oh, I'm yes. sure. Yeah. Yes. We're, we're very involved with everything here, a lot of things here, and I also have I'm close to the metro, so we can go downtown and um, interact with people and things going on at my old agency. Well, since you were in, yeah, since you were in the age, do you 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 react with the agency some from? Yes, still go down occasionally yeah. when there's seminars or something that I want to hear. Yes, yeah. and that's I enjoy that very much. Yeah. I hope you all have gotten a picture of the John and Marie here that we have. If you if you haven't been able to do that, you might bring that in now. I'm I'm really known as the uh, as Mr. Marie Lee. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, maybe next month I can bring Marie on. Good. Yeah. Because you'll get more out of her than you get out of me. Is, is that right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. No, she's fantastic. She's All right. Well, John, thank you very much for being on. Pleasure Who's to be Who, here. And I, pr I appreciate your coming on. And I, I enjoyed your book, and I hope the, the rest of you folks uh, find a way to get a copy of John's book because I think you'll find it to, to be very interesting. It, uh, I wouldn't say it's funny. It's not funny, but it's it's interesting because he has so many different experiences uh, growing up in rural Alabama. D by the way, do you uh, ever watch RFD TV on your television? Occasionally, because that's all uh, all about agriculture. Yes, uh, of the country. Well, folks, that's uh, it for who's who today.